next week. Uh, very much. which I've been working with uh, on the board or just as a volunteer for many, many years. And uh, this is my favorite thing that I get to do is to come and speak to professional caregivers, individuals in the field, as well as those of you who are active caregivers. And some of you who are working in the field with, with elderly or with caregivers in some capacity are also caregivers yourself. So many of us in this day and time can kind of relate to a lot of what's going on. I myself am what I call a secondary or even tertiary caregiver. Uh, my mother lives with, with uh, my brother and his wife, and I kind of help out in the background, so we're kind of doing that dance and figuring out how all this is going to happen. Um, but I'll talk a lot about that as we kind of move along. And today, as you see up here, I'm going to be speaking about managing difficult behaviors. Um, you know, and again, part of managing difficult behaviors is our, our ability to manage our own. So before you can help manage someone else's behavior, you have to be able to manage your reaction to some of those behaviors. And those behaviors become, especially once they become uh, consistent in your life on a daily basis. The kind of behaviors that you never kind of anticipated. But before we can even kind of begin to talk about that, let's do a little bit of something called Aging 101. Not that this is what we look like when we get older, although I dated a couple of people who didn't look far from that. But, uh, there was one of those, you know, I was drunk, it was late, you know, and, uh, and I shouldn't say that because my head ate sponsors in the corner over there, but I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, let's talk about aging and what it particularly means because for some people, you know, we all have two things, in, let me talk about this, we all have two things in life that we all have in common. We're all getting older, and we're all going to die. And someone the other day added taxes to that. We all pay taxes. But I think there are probably a lot of people who are not paying taxes, but for sure those people are also getting older, and they're all going to die. So we'll keep it in that sense. But our society, American society, is not really crazy about this whole idea of getting older. Um, I've been teaching, and, and actually before I was teaching, I was, I was administrator of geriatric psych facilities in San Antonio for many, many years. And after I did that, or while I was doing that, I started teaching adjunct uh, as a, um, in, in, at universities, and now I teach full time. Well, I have a class that I teach at University of Incarnate Work called Aging in America. And it's really interesting to me. A lot of students take that class because it's late. They don't like to get up early. It's a 6 o'clock class. I don't like to get up early either, which is why I came in at just a few minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've always been kind of a late person. So I like to teach night classes. So one of the classes I teach at night is called Aging in America. And I had a student in there this past semester who kind of shocked me by her comment. She's about 20 years old. And she said, you know, Dr. Lozano, she said, the thing about old people is that by the time you're 35, you all start to look alike. So I said, first of all, I said, 35? Seriously? And then I said, you know, we're, so I guess she thinks we all look like this guy right here once we get to 35. So you can, you can kind of see that, that already we kind of have this perception of what it is and what it's like to get older. We have our own internal feelings toward that. We have our own ideas. People spend millions and millions of dollars to look younger. Of course, they're just going to look 
Oh, it's like a good looking corpse in the coffin when it's all over. And you're going to go, oh, look at all the surgery she's had, but she's still dead. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. You're still going to die. And so as we start to move forward in this process, things start to happen to us. Just like me when I was coming over here the, to this morning, I, I just started to notice that I have like sideburns that all of a sudden in the last two weeks have really become pro I've never had, I look like Elvis Presley on this side of my face, <laughs> right here. I, and so, oh my gosh, I don't know whether to comb it <laughs> or shave it or spend money to get it taken out one at a time. I don't know what, or just go ahead and see what I look like with a beard. I haven't decided what that's, what I'm going to have to do with that, but those are kind of some of the things that start to really bind in. Right now, I, I mean, when I sat down, and even right now, I'm having a little bit of a hot flash. And the reason I'm sharing all of those things with you is because I need somebody to talk to. And, uh, and so I thought maybe y'all didn't have anything else to do this morning, so I wanted to share that with you. So. Just those kind of things that maybe seem funny, but they somehow kind of affect us in different ways. You don't move as well as you used to. You have more pain in the morning than you used to. You have more pain before you, you know, wake up at night. But the thing is, is that we keep moving forward and we keep trudging forward. I had the honor of, live, of having two grandmothers that lived to the age of 95. Um, you know, they, both of them did. Uh, one of them had dementia uh, later on in life. Uh, but the other one did not. And so, especially on my father's side, she was very active and very strong. They were very strong women. They knew how to work. They knew how to live their lives. And so they were great examples for me. So this is, this is how I started to get interested in this whole business of gerontology in the first place and why I dedicated my career to it. One of the things that I learned from them, does this look good? I just figured out how to do that. I, I can never, I don't remember how I did it, but I think it was just actually copy and paste. That probably wasn't anything too difficult. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't anything too difficult. When I was, when I, my grand, one of my, my mother's mother, um, who the, the, the grandmother that I was closest to, she was actually the oldest of 21 children. And uh, 18 of whom survived into their, into their later years. And uh, as, as you can see, with the, right now there are two living siblings of hers, uh, uh, both women, and they, uh, as we started to move along in life and people started to pass on, and we, we, we went to a lot of funerals, as you could tell. We had, they all had families, they all were married, they all had kids, and went on and on. They were, you know, good Catholic people, they had a lot of kids. And, well, when we go to these funerals, my Aunt Trina used to tell me, she said, you know, it's just a, this is just the wheel, this is just part of what's going to happen in your life. This is just part of life is you have the beginning and you have the end, but you start to move up the ladder. The more people older than you start to die, you get closer to that ladder, and we know what happens when you get to the top of the ladder. Then you make your way into the funeral home, I guess. That's the next step. <laughs> Somewhere along there. But the point is, is that it is part of life. And so if we start to think about the aging process and all the things that are going on with us, we have to also think about what is starting to affect us emotionally and mentally. And the will of life is going to help actually start that. So let's talk about losses just by itself at the very beginning, the losses that we start to experience. And I've actually started kind of to think about this myself in my own family because my family is shrinking. You know, my old, all the, I tell, I tell my friends sometimes, I said, I really miss hanging out with older people because they're gone. I mean, the, the people in my life. I still have my mother and my uncle and a couple of older aunts, but I used to hang around old people all the time. Now, they were probably not as old as I thought they were. Back when I was in my 20s, they were probably my age, and, but I still thought they were old. But I still kind of miss going to see them, and I used to pick them up in my, in my father's 63 Chevy and put like 18 old people as a joke. How many old people can we get my dad's 63 Chevy? i pick them up for Thanksgiving and bring them to the house and they waited for me out the curb like four hours early and then yelled at me because I wasn't there on time and all that kind of stuff. But I miss hanging out with them. So for older people, they too are experiencing kind of those losses in their life, not just individual people. So here what you see here is just ourselves. In our life, as we move along in life, this wheel of life, we have connections. We are connected to things like 
our church or, or whatever your spiritual services are, significant other, your spouse, your finances. You have, you have some sort of finances. You maybe had more when you were younger, but as you retire, those decrease. And maybe you still don't have money. Or none of us have money now. We'd be on the beach somewhere drinking margaritas. But um, we have that connection to H-E-B. Why did I put H-E-B up there? Because it's, you take it for granted. H-E-B is, who's, who's? H-E-B is a part of everyone's life. Can you raise your hand if H-E-B is a part of your life? H-E-B is a part of your life. So think about not being able to go to H-E-B anymore just to go get a dozen eggs or some milk or whatever it is that you particularly need or just a package of toilet paper, whatever it is. Our pets, how many of you have pets in this room or that you take care of? Not pets that are hanging onto the front tree in the front yard. I mean, a real pet. I'm talking about a pet who sleeps on your bed with blankets and pillows and those kind of pets. Those are kind of pets I'm talking about. And I don't mean your husband either. The pet's more important than the husband, and y'all know it. If there's a fire, he's going to have to stay in there and get the pet. <laughs> and of course we have connections to our we used to have stronger connections to our friends and neighbors especially if you live in older neighborhoods we were very connected to those parks to those individuals we, we depended on them we kind of took care of each other now we're kind of separated we, we really don't have those same connections we're not really sure who our neighbors are sometimes transportation the ability to be able to get on a car get on the bus go where you want to go when you want to go, what time you want to go, and get whatever it is you need to get. And of course our hobbies, you know, for some people it might be gardening and photography or fishing, whatever those things are. So we're moving along in life and, and you might can add some things to this. You think about the things in yourself that makes you part of your community, that makes you part of the community in, your, in Del Rio, in, in, in Texas, in the United States, the things that kind of connect you to your world. And so here we are, we're moving along fine in life, and now we start to get older, and this community around us really begins to get a lot smaller. So now what happens is that the self even gets a lot bigger. Why does the self get bigger? We start to get sometimes even more self-absorbed into what's happening with us. You know, some of us, there's different ways that we react to it. Some of it is, oh my gosh, Things are terrible, I have nothing, I have no one. How many of you have heard that before? Nobody comes to see me, I can't get to the store, I have to wait all the time, I don't know where to get help. All of those things kind of start to happen. People start to realize now that their, their self is now not as small as it used to be because they had so many things around them. Now it's bigger and so we're paying more attention to those pains, those aches, and all of those things that are going along, help going along. Now, in some cases, as long as that person hasn't moved into a long-term care facility or moved in with a family member, they still have friends and they still have neighbors. Now, again, your older friends start to kind of go on, you know, to that greater world outside of themselves. They start to lead to those losses they start to experience. And of course, we have the family and pets. But it's not long after that. Now, in some cases, depending on when you got that pet, that pet could outlive you. I mean, you know, because we take better care of our pets sometimes than we do ourselves. So in some cases, that can happen. But the pets can easily go away, too, through death. That's another loss. If you have to move to another facility, that can be a loss. To a facility, that's a loss as well. Um, there's actually an organization now that actually helps people who are moving to long-term care facilities, and they help get those pets adopted. And what they do is they get them adopted, but they make it, they make an agree, they have an agreement with the person who's adopting to bring that pet to the nursing home or to the assisted living to visit that person on a regular basis. Because not only that, the pet suffers a lot too. The pet actually has some time, goes through depression. And of course, family, you know, they kind of say, so now here's what we've got. We've kind of, we've kind of backed off. Now we've, we've lost the pet, maybe not neighbors anymore. So that person is one important thing that's going on here. That here, that person is very isolated. That isolation is still, and they have their family. Let's say that person moves in with the family, or the family moves in with that person, which some of you are already experiencing now. So what is this person going to focus on? The self and what else? Who are they going to now, be, what becomes their world? The family. That family becomes that world for them. So everything in life that's going on that's happening 
is not only the responsibility of that family, but it's the fault of that family. Or the good things for that family, depending on what, what that person's looking at, but in some cases it's the fault. Now, this doesn't mean that all the family's involved. It just means there's certain ones that are involved. In some cases, you would hope that all the family would be involved. In most cases, it's a very small group of family members that are helping to kind of circle their wagons around this person who has dementia and, or, or has uh, issues with cognitive issues or even physical issues, and they kind of begin to manage that. But you can see now why the, the older person now has this attachment to the family member, even if they're not living with them, because this is who they become dependent on for some reason. Now, other family members... Other, other, uh, I'm sorry, other older adults maybe are not really connected to the family. They want to stay independent, so they're trying to hide all the stuff that's not going right in the house. All the things that they're not doing. Or they're doing the very last thing that they can do to hang on. Now, let me just also say this. There are older adults who are a lot of times who are doing just fine. We've decided that somehow we need to kind of take control of their lives for whatever reason, just because they're old. Remember, they are still able to make decisions. If they're able to make decisions and their decisions are not hurting them or anyone else, then, there's, then just leave them alone. And those are independent adults and living their lives. So keep that in mind as well. But then, of course, the, the, the conference we're having today doesn't have to do with independent adults who are able to do things on their own. Does it? We're talking about a different group. So now we have this kind of hard work ahead. Now you've become a caregiver, rather by choice, or you were born, and they, you know, they, they threw holy water on you and said, you're going to be the caregiver, and this is what's been decided from the very beginning. Or you throw holy water on yourself, saying, I'll be the caregiver, or whatever you've done, you have this, this is what's happened. This is the role that you've now taken on. So let's talk about some of this hard work ahead, beside the fact I like this little symbol here. I thought it was kind of cool. Let's just start to look at, once the person's moved in, some of the things that you're already having to start to begin to look at and to deal with. Some of the, some of the behavioral, but some of the functional losses that we see. Let's just look at these. Willingness and ability to beg. How many of you are struggling in dealing with this or have been in the past? So we have like probably five or six of you are kind of dealing with this. This is one of the major issues in with anyone with dementia that you start to see is this decline in hygiene and unwillingness to beg. Now, I have a lot of my own personal theories and my work experience and, my, and academically what I've read as to what particularly is going on. You know, nobody really can say what it is except that this is what happens. I used to think it's because the water was too cold. I used to think it's because they didn't want anybody to help them in the shower. I used to think that it was just too much for them to stand up that long and take a shower, or they were afraid to fall in the shower. But I, I don't know. It could be any of those things. It could be none of those things. But what we do know is this is an issue that occurs. And it's, it's a battle you're going to have to decide how you're going to manage that battle. And we'll talk about that in a second. Grooming also is part of it, which also kind of goes along with that. As you start to see this as the person really progresses, that they're not really combing their hair, they're putting their jacket on backwards, their, their shoes are on backwards, they're wearing the same dirty clothes that they had on yesterday and they refuse to take them off, they want to leave those on, those are the, the clothes that they like. And so this is when I tell people you have to become a magician. <clears throat> You have to figure out a way to make them, like maybe there's a pair of shorts that they like to wear, or a pair of slacks that they like to wear, or a certain house coat they like, buy three or four of them. Buy three or four of them. Now, first of all, you say, well, that's going to be fine, but then what do we do to get them off, get the one off they have on? You know, then we got to figure that little trick out. So then you get in kind of that battle, and then you know the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to call Adult Protective Services and report you for the elder abuse. <laughs> you know, because you're trying to get on the bed with them and fighting with them to get their clothes off and all that kind of stuff is happening. So we'll talk in just a second about maybe some of that dressing. And also then we look at functional ability because now they have difficulty with their gait and mobility. 
meaning that when they're, you know, try to put their pants on, they can't really stand on one leg, they have to be in a different position, they insist that this is the way they want to do it and you know they're going to fall, something like that's going to happen. Just the way they walk, they walk slower, or they have, they're tripping over rugs, whatever the case might be. These are all the things that are going to now, that now brings you closer to that person, not necessarily in a, in a nice way, but in a physical way in which you're going to have to do something to kind of help them take care of some of these things. And it could be that morning is your worst time, getting them out of bed, getting them dressed, getting them off the clothes that they have on, getting them maybe shower, getting them to take their meds, getting them to eat, all of those things begin to happen. Um, and this is part of what we see with the measure. And then toileting is just a whole issue within itself, making sure that that's happening, trying to get them to the bathroom once an hour or once every two hours to make sure that they don't soil on themselves. And so all of this then becomes, becomes a struggle for the caregiver and very difficult. Uh, even communication and writing skills, in some regards, I started to, to notice this with my mother at the very beginning when she first, when I first started seeing changes that she could not really read. She was an avid reader. She read all the time, but she had difficulty finishing a, finishing a page. And you could tell that she was having difficulty. She would act like she was, her eyes were tired. Something else was wrong. That's, what, that's not what it was. So she would kind of try to compen compensate for that as well. Uh, and so that can be very frustrating. So think about it already. Think about all the losses we just talked about when I was talking about aging. And now we see some of these that are common in what we see with dementia. Some of it with aging, not all of it. And think about what they're going through. Now, do you think that they know what they're going through? They do. Do they think about it and process it and ruminate over it? No. They feel it. Makes them feel maybe just sad. They don't know why they're sad. They can't figure out why they're sad. It might make them feel angry. They don't know why they're angry, but they feel angry. They are experiencing the loss of themselves as much as you're experiencing the loss of that person. You're watching them kind of fade away right before you. So now they're experiencing those things too. Once we begin to understand and really take in within ourselves that this person is struggling and having a difficult time with everything they're experiencing. I mean, how many of you like to go into the hospital? Anyone? One of the thing, reasons that people don't like to go to the hospital, number one, we don't, like to be sick, we don't want to be sick. One of the other reasons we don't like to go is because it's difficult to have people do stuff with us, especially if you're not able to bathe yourself, especially if the, those kind of things that are very personal and private to us begin to occur. And you can imagine, now they've had all these losses, their home, their neighbors, the place they've known for all these years, their work, going to HEB, all going to church on a regular basis, all the things that were very important to them in their lives, and now they've moved in with you, and now they're having these, experiencing these as well. That's a lot. That is a lot for one person to start to take on. We're not even talking about yourselves as caregivers yet. We haven't even gotten to that point. You heard some of that in the talk before, which really spoke to that. We have to understand that. Sometimes they're feeling anxious and don't know why they feel anxiety. They're very nervous. All of these things can start to occur. Now, what are some of the things that we can do? We'll get to, the, we'll get to that in just a little bit. I didn't forget that. Here's some of the behavioral symptoms that we might start to see um, that are more common. And this is not with the caregiver behavioral symptoms, although I think the caregiver has these behavioral symptoms as well. And it's not as fun to have these symptoms that everybody else is having them in the house too. It's much more fun just to have these on your own and be the only one feeling this way. But when there's two or three people feeling this way, that could be chaos in the home, exactly. That could be chaos in the home. Irritable, agitated, anxiety, and pacing, all of the above. <coughs> Is it all related to the dementia? It can be related to dementia, but we also need to understand that it's also related to two other things. One, as I mentioned before, 
all of the losses of that, that that person is experiencing and their sadness and anxiety that goes along with that. And two, personality. What was their personality like before the dementia began to kind of take over their lives? There was a study I read about 10 years ago, and I didn't, it didn't leave my head, because what it says is, is that the personality characteristics in our lives that are not our finest hour, from our finest hour, we all know what those are for us individually, exacerbate 100% with dementia. So, that old saying, if you were like a mean old lady, you're gonna, it's, you, you had to be a mean old woman. Mean young woman. So if you're a mean young woman, you're going to be a mean old woman. If you're an anxious young woman, you're going to be an anxious old woman. If you're a dirty young man, you're going to be a dirty old man. And it kind of goes along the same way. If you're a dirty old woman, you, young woman, you're going to be a dirty old woman. Whatever the case might be. Or at least use that for an excuse anyway. Just say, I've always been like that. But whatever the situation is, now that we're going to carry those personality traits into this dementia, and it's all because you know what they are? They're coping skills. The way that you've been coping, the way that you cope with situations in your life, the way that you manage stress, situations, relationships, all of those things now are going to show themselves without the walls in front, when the walls have fallen down with dementia. So a lot of times, and I've heard this with my own mother as well, how much of it is her personality and how much of it is the dementia? Because sometimes you swear that she knows or he knows exactly what they're doing. You would bet a paycheck on it. You would bet money on it. You just know that's what's happening. What you're seeing sometimes is still that person kind of shining and coming through. That little people like, like that you see in that person that you recognize that personality and then you see it with all the dementia behaviors that come along with that. And sometimes that's not very pretty. Here's the thing to remember. Hopefully you don't have dementia. So if you don't have dementia, you still got your personality and your coping skills. Who's the one that has control over it? I know. Don't you just love to blame stuff on other people? Wouldn't it just be easier if we could say, if only, wouldn't our lives be easier if everyone that we knew in our life did exactly what we told them to do every single time? How many of you want that in your life? Wouldn't that just be boring, though? Because then you'd just be sitting back going, oh, my family, my friends have no problems. My co-workers, they're great. They're perfect to work with. They do exactly everything I tell them every single time. <laughs> exactly. But they don't. Because then we end up looking like this little guy right over here. <laughs> this is really very important. Reduce tolerance for stress. Not our own, because we have that too. Because the more stress we experience, the more we digress. Stress, digress. Stress, digress. This is also true of the person that you're caring for with dementia or Alzheimer's, and or Alzheimer's. They have a reduced tolerance for stress. So, the more stress they see you, the more stress they get. The more stress they see everybody in the house, the more stress they get. The louder the music, the louder the TV, the hot, the, if the food is hot, trying to get them to shower, trying to get them to take their medications, you're sweating, you're running around, you're crying because they won't do what you're asking them to do, you're stressed out of your mind, they're going to experience that too. Or they get really quiet. How many of you have seen that? Where they just get quiet. Why do you think they get quiet? They can be fear. They don't know what's happening. They're like, what's wrong with her? Why is she acting like that? I don't remember that I just told I just slapped at you and told you not to change my shirt. I don't remember that I just told you I wasn't getting in the shower and yelled at you and pushed you away. I don't remember that I just slapped all the medicines out of your hand and they fell on the floor. What's wrong with her? Have a bad day. What's wrong with this lady? Right? 
And you can't sit there and go, all I'm trying to do is get you to take this medicine so we can go have breakfast. This is what they hear. All I'm trying. They can't figure out anything else more than that. That big old long sentence you just said doesn't seem like a big old long sentence, but to a dementia person, it's a big old long sentence. They might have gotten some of those words out of there. They can't put it all together. But we're trying to talk to them and tell them this is what we're trying to do. I care for you. I'm trying to help you. This is going to be good for you. This is what the doctor said. You know how many times in Spanish my mother told me that the doctor just can go to hell? Yeah, I had another. I won't say the rest. You know what I'm trying to say. That's what my mother said. But the doctor, oh, she just cussed the doctor out. And then when we would go to the doctor, and we'd sit there in front of the doctor, and I said, Doctor, can you explain to my mother? And and then the do and the doctor would say, she goes, I don't, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> Let me tell you this story. Take a little break. Went to Walmart. My mother wanted underwear. Okay. She wants some other things. Of course, she wants everybody to pay for her stuff because she's an old person. She doesn't think old people should pay for anything. <laughs> so we went to Walmart. She needed underwear. So she needed size six underwear. I'm sorry I'm telling you my mother's underwear size. Maybe it was seven. So she wanted a certain package of underwear with certain color underwear. So we couldn't find the package, but I found all white. She didn't like those. I said, Mom, I just looked all over. You know Walmart, you gotta go through everything because they got stuff scattered. So we looked through everything. They don't have them. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So I just let her look. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go get help. I'm going to go see if somebody can help. So I went and got the person that was working in the department. She was very nice. She came over. I said, my mother's looking for size 7. You know, she comes around and she and she looks around too. She goes to my mother. She said, ma'am, we don't have those that size and that package you're looking for. She goes, I didn't need your help. She needs your help. She points to me. So the girl looks at me like, I'm not getting in the middle of this and she kind of walks off. But the, but the problem was, was that I thought that I did the right thing by going to get the girl to kind of talk to her, but my mother was smart enough in her coping skills and her abilities to be able to look at me to let me know that she didn't really need my help. So we just sat, I went and found a place to sit down and she looked around for the longest time and came back with a different kind of package and then got upset because I said, well, why don't we go to the cashier now? And she goes, well, I have to pay for these. <laughs> so these are kind of some of the battles. You try to keep your stress level down because you don't want them to kind of react to it. And are they, are they, is she doing that on purpose? Did my mother do that on purpose? There's several things going on in that little scenario. One is a fight. I'm the oldest daughter. So oldest daughter, Hispanic oldest daughters and their mother, do I say anymore? <laughs> What's the battle there? You're still my daughter, I'm in charge, you, you know, you're, she still thinks that I'm going to, she tells me sometimes, you're going to take my place when I leave. And you're going to be the one, I, I'm not going to be the grandmother, I'm not going to be any of that. You're always going to be, but this is how she thinks. She sees that competition, which is why she's living with King, the king of the family. The youngest son, the only son. You know, the, the, the one they made the movie over was Simba. That's my brother. The one they hold up to the sun. <laughs> and that song comes on. When he walks in the room, that song comes on. The one that throws coins when he walks in the room. For the small people around. That brother. People look at me. Why is it, why is it your mother living with you? You're the oldest daughter. And ask her. She's living with King. <laughs> Increased stress for caregivers and patients is more likely to occur as stress increases. We just finished talking about some of those things. Not only that, but night waking up at night, not only the person you're caring for, but you yourself kind of, we talked about this in the last talk, 
the morning side would talk about how you ruminate kind of over some of those behaviors. But you see even more catastrophic behaviors sometimes where they become aggressive, physically aggressive, pushing, shoving, scratching, where it scares you because not only can you are taking a risk of getting hurt yourself, but they can get hurt as well. Purposeful wandering, confusion, agitation, combative behavior. All of these behaviors are very difficult for us to deal with, much less having to deal with somebody who's a loved one. Now, you know, my, my, uh, I've spent my whole career working in the field of aging. And I spent my whole career, my, even my academic career, learning how to work with older people. I have a PhD in gerontology and a master's in gerontology, and none of it works with my mother. <laughs> none of it. So I just want to tell you all, if none of this works with your family member, I am not responsible. <laughs> I'm going to have to go ahead and just say, don't sue me and say, Dr. Lozano said that this was going to work and none of it works. I don't know what else to tell you, but it doesn't work with her, and I'm thinking that it probably won't work with some of y'all either. <laughs> the only thing that I think that I know that works is what we do for ourselves in helping to manage it. We can only do so much. Diminished reserve, their, their energy levels just kind of decrease their ability to kind of, to be able to kind of keep information in their head is going away. And some days they wake up and their brains are working like they were, like nothing had ever happened. You know, does it last? No. And that happens to me too. <laughs> Actually, you know, I'm just thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about. It happens to all of me. I know what happens to me. Sometimes I wake up and I don't, I don't even know where I'm at. I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, those days are gone. I, don't have my <laughs> I can't do that anymore. I'm too tired. Um, but some of the sources of stress, when you think about your environment in your home, think about some of the things that are going on to kind of increase that stress level. When I used to work with nursing home facilities, one of the things that we talked about is to keep the noise level down. Do your best to make that happen. Loud TVs, because a lot of times, you know, they're not recognizing noises. The doorbell ringing, the microwave ringing, they don't recognize the washer going on, the air conditioner kind of kicking in. Those things can kind of be, they're like, what's that noise? You ever hear that? What's that noise? They don't recognize that noise anymore, it's gone. Um, the, uh, people talking, that they, not, they think that it's really people in the room talking to them, and it's really people on TV. My mother still gets novellas mixed up. She gets novellas mixed up with what's happening in our family life. So a lot of times she thinks I've just done horrible things and I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> kill somebody, take their heart, sell it, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, too many people, you know, at some point, and I know this is hard, but at some point it's not necessary for them to go to every single party there is in the family. I think it's important for them to be around family. But if you've got a family of like 95 that come to one one-year-old communion or whatever party, and we know those Mexicans and Americans in the room know what I'm talking about. Because that's how many show up for cataract surgery for the family. <laughs> one person's having cataract surgery, 95 people in the waiting room. We're, that's what happens. And we bring sandwiches and chicken and dry coke and coke and coke. We have, we have like a tailgate party in the parking lot of the parking lot. <laughs> Too many things going on at once. If your family's not necessarily a quiet family, but there's too much going on, the kids are running around, all of it, that can be very distracting. It may, it may scare them into some kind of isolated behavior at that point, but later on they're going to be very anxious and you're going to have to deal with that when they go to bed at night. So try to just keep it at peace. Now, a lot of caregivers sometimes will tell me, I try to do that, but I, the, the quietness is driving me crazy. You can have some music on, you can have conversation, you can have one or two or three family members come over and have a conversation, they like that. I mean, where's the best place in your house to have a conversation? Kitchen. There you go. Take them to the kitchen, get a cup of coffee, a little fun, if you can, if you want. 
have that and have a little conversation there because that's where all the world problems are solved. That's where it's, that's where it all happens. It's a little platica right there in the kitchen. That, you know, try to bring things into their environment. You have to experiment that were familiar to them. And I'm going to tell you that when you go, all of any of us, when we're hanging around the kitchen or the picnic table in the backyard with a couple of cold beers and the barbecue pit going, those are things that are going, that really make us feel kind of we recognize it makes us feel safe. It's important to us. That's what our family used to do. That's that kind of that memory that's somewhere in the back that's recognizable. They may not be able to tell you what it is, but they, it makes them feel good. Same thing with music. I, 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 my, a friend of mine the other day was telling me, one of the things that reminded me a lot of my grandmother and parents growing up was that little Mexican radio station in the background of the house, in the bathroom or in the kitchen, that was like all staticky, but every once in a while you can understand what they were singing. But that really makes you, really relaxes me a lot. I mean, I don't know why, but I think for some people they like to have that in the background too, that music that they relate to and that's important to them. Um, so you want to try to make sure also that you're not saying, eat your dinner, take your medicine, and putting some, the music on at the same time. A, a lot of nursing home facilities and assisted living facilities really try to do this differently. This is a struggle for them and with dietary to try to make that happen for them differently. But you have to try to do that too. Try not to do everything at one time. Try to find out when they're most relaxed and try to work their medicines around that. Now here's the other thing. You need to talk to your doctor, the doc not that person's doctor, and say, is there any way I can change the medicine time? Try to do something different. The doctor will work with you if they can. There's usually a reason sometimes to take the medicine beforehand, but it's also important for you to maybe ask and say, it really would make my life a lot easier if I could do it differently. Try to figure that out. So if you have a home health nurse or a nurse you can talk to, try to talk to him or her just to make that happen. Other sources of stress, you like my little zebra here? <laughs> Side effects of medication. They're hungry or thirsty sometimes. One of the things that happens with older people, I can tell you a lot, is that they don't get enough water. We don't think about giving them water, or they just throw it on the floor when we give it to them. But we need to try to get water in them, because that's going to be, for one thing, we don't want to give a urinary tract infection, which can also exacerbate symptoms of dementia, or cause even new ones, even psychotic behavior for that matter. And of course, any changes with the caregiver, boy, let me tell you what, when they get used to that schedule, they get used to that schedule. And if you get off that schedule, they do not like it at all. Now, they can't tell you. Now, you might feed them every day at 12 o'clock for lunch. And you can say, what time, you know, Grandma, what time do you eat lunch? I don't know. They don't know what time, but they know, they kind of feel it. So this is called muscle memory. They have this biological clock. We all have it. We all have that biology. You know that day you're like, okay, Saturday, I don't have to work, I'm going to sleep in a little bit, and you still wake up like at 6. That's that biological clock working. Not me. Um, my biological clock, it's, it's, I'm good, I'm doing good if I can get to sleep before 1 o'clock in the morning or 2. Uh, but the Spurs played last night, it was like sleeping pill for me, so I was really good. Uh, and also try to stay on the routine and also the environment. Try, it might be too cold, it might be too hot, it might be uncomfortable. You know, could, side effects of medication can affect their temperature. So you have to pay attention to all those things. These are sources of stress. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to prevent the behavior from happening. This is what we're going to try to do. So figure out what those sources of stress are. The demands that exceed their abilities that we try to get them to do things. What do you want to do? Do you want to have pancakes or do you want to have eggs and you want me to fix your thumb? Oh no, don't do that. Don't give them choices. Know what they like to eat though, know what kind of food they like to eat and, and try to give them that. Tasks that are outside of their abilities to, okay, here's what I want you to do. Go to your room and uh, get them dressed and I'll go in there in a minute and help you get take a shower. What's going to happen? You're going to find them in the living room watching TV. They're, 
you, you've got to understand what they're going to get past a certain step, and they're not going to remember. Sometimes it's one step, depending on the day, how they feel. Sometimes you can give them three things to do, and they'll do it. Most of the time, it's not going to be like that. Most of the time, it isn't. It's a small, quick little trick that I used to use when I used to do quick assessments on somebody to determine whether or not they had beginning signs of dementia or they had dementia and were in denial. Ask them to make a sandwich. They can't do those, they can't do that many steps. Even cook an egg for that matter. This is how I knew my grandmother had dementia. She was a fabulous cook. Absolutely fabulous. And it didn't matter when you went over to her house, she had something in the refrigerator she had made that tasted so good that she put out there for you to just hang out there in the kitchen. She'd always give you that little orange banner drink, too. Oh my gosh, it was so good. But anyway, she, she she invited me over for dinner, and she was she had a big pot of, um, really too big of a pot that was boiling oil, like enough oil to like for a whole habanino or something. <laughs> she had it in there. And she put bologna in it. So I, being the person that I was, or am, I could not not eat it. Oh man, it was bad. But she deep fried bologna and gave me two pieces of bread and a pambusa and told me to enjoy it. It was bad. The pambusa was bad too. <laughs> but that's when I knew that something was wrong and I really knew for sure that something was wrong and her inability to kind of do that was very sad. Um, then look at the restrictive feedback. Don't do that. Your parents are dead. They're not alive. Why do you keep asking for them? Be very careful with that. Now, Naomi Fowles, some of you are probably already familiar with her. She talks about validation therapy. In my years and my experiences of working in jury site, working in inpatient site, and working with dementia and Alzheimer's patients, I'm going to tell you that validation is probably the most effective that I've ever seen, depending on what stage the person is at, especially early to even through modern and middle stages. You can have those conversations. It's still very effective. And you have to be very careful because you don't want to get carried away in the story either. You know, where you add stuff to it, and then next thing you know, it's like a big novella, and you're trying to remember what you said. And, but you want to just go ahead and kind of keep, just say, yes, I, you know, I bet you miss your parents. My mother talks about her parents a lot right now. So I'll ask her, you know, about about them. And I, she'll say, I remember this, I remember that. And she was she was a migrant, she was my grandparents were migrant farm workers. She remembers working in the, in the, farm a lot. She was telling me the other day a story that I had never heard before. On Mother's Day, she was telling me how my grandmother would carry her potato sack on her back when she first had her, so she, she was picking, my grandmother was picking cotton. So I think that was a really great story and a visual for me to have in my head, thinking about my grandmother doing that with my mother. And, um, you know, I, I thought that was kind of neat. Um, uh, but this is your house. Try to correct them. Uh, and you know, the other thing is sometimes people try to tell people like, you're living in your house, this is your house, and they, that's not really their home, but you're trying to make it think that's like their home, so it's why important. It's important that they have some of their things that they have from their home out in your home now. So maybe kind of replace some of the things that you have. The couch with the plastic cover, go ahead and bring it in. I mean, whatever. <laughs> That'll work too. And if, you know, going to work to say, gosh, I remember you, you, your job is really hard. Uh, but what is your boss's name or what do you do? Once you start doing that, then that kind of, not instead of arguing with them, that kind of helps. And I have another suggestion I'll talk about real, right here, too. I have noticed that this little trick has been working with my mother. And I've noticed that it's been half working for about the last six to eight months. I don't know if it's where she's at in her dementia or not, but here's what I, I just want to tell you that it's working. Her repetitive questions, I'm able to redirect her pretty quickly. Here's what, here's what she'll say. She'll say, Maricela's my, her oldest granddaughter. She asks for her often, and she'll say, have you seen Maricela? She's still driving my car because she gave her my car, gave her, gave her a, she would like to have given her my car, but she gave her her own car. So she gave Monticello the car. And so she'll say, have you seen Monticello? Is she driving my car? Have you seen? And I'll say, yeah, I have seen her. Yes, the car's doing good. She'll ask me again. And she'll ask me again. So what I did is I said, Mom, did I tell you that Monticello's driving your car and she's doing good? Oh, no, you didn't tell me. That's good. Oh, that's good. And then I'll 
few minutes later, like li two minutes, literally, I'll say, Mom, did I tell you that Mommy said, oh, yes, yeah, that's good. She quits asking me a question. She goes on to the next thing, if that. Or sometimes she'll say, yes, yes, you already told me. How many times are you going to tell me? I mean, she'll me so then I know that that's over, too. So whatever she does, it kind of works. So I just repeat it to her, and I tell her, you know. We, she was trying to remember the color of my uncle's car, the, my uncle's truck the other day. I said, it's tan. So then I'd say, Mom, what color, what color truck does Bethel have? Oh, it's, it's, it's beige, kind of beige, yes. And then we did that twice, and she quit, and then never asked me that question again. So I, it's working. It's working with other things, and I don't know if it's just her or she gets tired of me asking her the questions over and over. But I think y'all should try that, see if that works. And if you already tried it, it doesn't work. Remember, I'm not responsible to set. I'm not suing me for the stuff that I'm telling you is going to work, and I don't know if it probably won't work. We're just sitting here getting to know each other. Try to keep the stress at a manageable level throughout the day. Um, try to give them as much autonomy. Try to give them as much independence as you think that they can do so that they can feel like they're doing that kind of on their own. You know, get, let them feel like they're still in charge of something. Now, at the later stages, the, the moderate late to late stages, obviously that's not going to be the case. But they need to feel as if they have some level of autonomy. And keep that in mind, too. And your interventions are like memory crutches that kind of fills in the gaps. Because you have, like, you, ha you, you, you have gaps in that person's daily acti activities of daily living, independent activity, uh, uh, activities of daily living, and you need to kind of fill those gaps. You're kind of their memory crutch for that, and that's what you want to do. So let's be cautious. Don't you like a little sign? I put that like this. Look for changes in behavior that are warning signs of impending aggressive behavior. How many of you have said, I knew something was wrong, I knew they were having a bad day, I knew I shouldn't have done How many of you have said that before to yourself? So you know, you're very aware. For my mother, if she's got to be on her schedule, you get her off her schedule for too long, she starts to get agitated. And so why would I agitate her then by deciding to get in an argument with her at that particular moment? Or when she fights with me at the restaurant because she has to pay? When she stays with me for a weekend, she wants me to pay every single meal. She's like, she doesn't want, I'm never coming over here again. But, you know, you invited me to come to the house and come with you and now you want me to pay. This is it. I'm not coming back here ever again. This is it. This is it. Take me to the key. <laughs> Sometimes you see kind of irritable motor activity, maybe just some just sign, maybe knocking like this, and a little, maybe a bit of rocking, be looking for that. And you have to think to yourself, you have to figure it out. What do they need? Are they hungry? Um, are, they, are, are they in pain? Uh, even pacing, if the pacing begins to increase, these can be signs of something getting ready to happen. Rising level of agitation that's different, different at that moment than what you've seen before. They are letting you know that something is about to happen. At the nursing homes, a lot of times they would say, I don't know what happened. I just came up behind her in a wheelchair and started rolling. And I said, first of all, did you let them know that you were going to start pushing her behind the wheelchair? Oh, no, I didn't. Well, hello. I would have been swinging at you too. You scared the crap out of me, man. You gotta tell me that you're gonna push me on the wheelchair. I mean, have a community, some level of communication. They can't sit still. That's also another sign. These are all signs for me too. If I'm gonna get agitated, this is what I start to do. <laughs> Remember, dementia is incurable, but not untreatable. We have to keep that in mind. We want to do everything we can to enhance and strengthen and preserve the abilities that they continue to have. You know what they are. You have them out there already in your head. You know what he or she can't do, and you need to help them to come. You need to do everything you can to preserve that, because eventually that's going to be gone. But we need to preserve that. It makes them feel better about themselves, too. 
Um, we talked about avoiding overstimulation. Uh, make sure and treat any other illnesses they have, you know, hypertension, diabetes, chronic arthritis, whatever else they might have. And more than likely they have none of that, because like we said earlier, with Morningside, you've been done such a good job with them that they're great. The only one having all those other symptoms are you. You're the one having the heart attacks and the pains and all the arthritis. And, um, so you need to treat not only their complications, but all other illnesses, but yours as well, I hope. Uh, provide education and guidance for families, for yourself. Seek the resources you need. Use the Alzheimer's Association, other resource, warning sign, uh, other other resources you can do to reach out and get some some help. If you assume that they probably can't do anything, that just means you've given up. You have to just keep trying. If someone tells you no, then you have to go to someone else. I can guarantee you that if those people, the Alzheimer's Association, or cannot help you, that they're going to make sure that you get the help you need. They're going to get you to the person that can hopefully help you. More than likely is going to be able to do that. You have to learn to rely on other resources. You cannot be the only wagon at the party. If you say we're going to surround the wagons around the person with dementia, and you're the only wagon there, well, hello, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to get you from the mountain somewhere. And they're going to get you. You're going to have to surround yourself with other resources. And we're going to talk about this in the next, after lunch, but I just want to say this. I know that you're doing the very best that you can, and you're probably, no one loves that person more than you do, if, if you still love them. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> everybody's like, oh my gosh, she's so rude. Or, or oh my gosh, she's so right. Um, but the point is, there are, you cannot do it by yourself. You do not have to be the only one there. You do not have to put yourself in that position. The only reason you're in that position is because you've decided that you're in that position. If your family is not helping you at all, there are other people outside of your family that can help you. But if you've decided you're the only one who can do it, and you're the only one who can do it right, or if the person you care for is saying, I don't want anybody in this house, I just want you to do that. You know what? You don't have to listen to them. They're not the boss of you. You, you. you need to go ahead and make those decisions. That's what's better for everyone. Did you like my great academic scholarly statement, they're not the boss of you? Um, other warning signs, they're refusing meds, they're starting to withdraw. These are kind of some of the things you can look at to keep in caution. Um, I love this one, concealed memory losses. You know, they're hiding the fact that they don't know what the heck is going on around them. Um, wandering, sleep disturbance, we talked about that. Losing and hiding things. Oh my gosh, losing and hiding things is a big one, is it not? Um, especially money. My mother's really big on that, trying to make sure that no one rips her off. Um, Inappropriate sexual behaviors, how many of you started to see some of that kind of go, go on too? So you really important, we have an actual talk that we do on that with the Alzheimer's Association, um, so maybe we can do that at a different time, but there are ways in which that can be managed, uh, and there are ways in which that can be dealt with, but more importantly, always just remember that they are not able to kind of control some of this, and you have to do the same thing in redirecting that behavior in a more private situation, a more private setting. And we talked about this in Alzheimer's Association last year at a conference we did. I had several caregivers that came up to me, especially married caregivers who said this behaviors were occurring, because in, in one situation, the man did not recognize his wife going in and out of the room sometimes. So he thought, oh, look, there's another lady for me. You know, so it was like constant. He wanted to have sexual relations constant all the time because it was like a new woman. Oh, look, Betty. Oh, look, Sue. Oh, look, you know, so in his head, and she was not having a good time. <laughs> so, fear. You know, you have to be scared if you have, every time somebody walks in the room as a stranger, and it takes you a minute to figure out who they are. When you walk, when you wake up in the morning, you go, where am I? And you really don't recognize the place that you're in. You don't recognize the room. 
They might recognize you, but they don't recognize anything else. And now you're trying to stuff pills down their mouth and get them to get naked and get the shower. They're scared. So orient them as much as you can. Good morning. It's Tuesday morning. You know, that, you know, that kind of thing. But also remember, if they're the kind of person who didn't like happy people in the morning, don't be a happy person. Because <laughs> then they're going to like not like that. You know how those people that are happy like at 6 in the morning? Oh, man. That's just, I don't know why God created those people. <laughs> Validation, we talked about that. Now, here is something I want to talk about, these two right here, boredom and hunger. You know, you think to yourself, oh, they're having a great day. And then they got agitated in the afternoon. Well, it's because they sat in the living room for six hours. That's boredom. Now, you may not have time. You might be washing sheets, washing clothes, trying to get dinner ready, trying to get lunch ready. You don't have time to sit there and be the three ring, ringling brothers circus form. I mean, you don't have time to do all that. But maybe just some music is going to help that. Maybe having a schedule of when one or two people can come over and visit for a while. Maybe having them stay, you know, for, for women, this is probably going to work this generation where you can have them go in the kitchen and maybe help you fold towels or dry some forks and knives. Maybe not real sharp knives in case they make you, you, you know, you make them mad. But, you know, these are kind of some of the things that you can start to think about doing. And the other thing is, is um, not to have any distractions. <laughs> no, it's okay. The only reason I didn't get agitated is because it was a good song. <laughs> no, it's okay. And then find out, maybe, you know, if you knew that person well enough, you know what their eating habits are. So maybe they like to have a little snack in the afternoon. Maybe they like to have a little something sweet. I mean, those are all the kind of, all the kind of things, too, you can try to remember to keep as much of who they were, their life that surrounded them, very much the same, and provide that for them. Another thing, too, is that one of the things that often gets ignored with seniors, and I started to work with this group a little bit in San Antonio, and that is geriatric dental group, to problems with their teeth. Pain, tooth pain can be very irritating and agitating. How many of you know that to be true? Earaches can be very agitating and irritating, very painful. So make sure that they're, they're not having a toothache that day, or an earache that day, or a headache that day. My mother refers to, she had a headache, and she said that her wrist was hurting her. Well, we didn't think, it, it was like a year ago, she, recently she wrist was hurting because she fell, but this was like a year ago, she was referring to her head. But a lot of times she said she had a headache when she didn't want to do something. Like she said, oh, I have a headache, I need to lay down. Well, it's because she wanted to go lay down. But when she comes to my house, she didn't get to take naps. No naps. Because I want her to sleep. And she's knocking on the door at 6 to get her medication. You know, I'm knocking on my door at 6. You all know that already. So I have to hire somebody to work between 5 and 8 just to help my mother out in the morning because I can't do it. So... Also, boredom. What are some things you have? I can't tell you too many things to do because everyone's different. And some people, you know, like, oh, we'll play checkers. Well, if they never played checkers their whole life, you think they're going to want to play checkers now? No. Maybe get a, do they like bingo? Oh, you take me to the casino and bingo, I am going to be happy. You have a little fake bingo machine there? Look, I'm playing bingo. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm playing bingo. So you might want to try to do some different things with them. Maybe put some sports on, maybe help them to pot a plant for you, a small plant in the house, nothing major. You know, don't like give them a lawnmower and an edger and tell them to go out and hold back on that. <laughs> don't do anything like that. <laughs> but you know, it's just something to help kind of keep those, things. think about what it is they like to do and keep that in mind. Because I think boredom's, uh, uh, boredom is an important issue with, with stress. Repeating questions, repetitious actions, and all the things we talked about. How about being territorial? How many of you recognize that? That's some of the behaviors that you see as well. And you know what? Go ahead and let them have, let, let them, you know, just let them have their little territory. That's important to them. And when they're not looking or when they're sleeping, you go in and just change it all up. 
I mean, that's that's kind of, the, I know that sounds very trick, and, and I'm not saying you have to stay up 24 hours a day so you can trick them. Um, but here's something else, hallucinations, delusions, and illusions. These, the hallucinations and delusions are really part of psychotic behaviors that can be very common with dementia and, 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 and or Alzheimer's disease as well. And so these behaviors can be very scary. They, can, they, they mix up their dreams with reality. They think someone's trying to break in the house, someone's stealing their money, um, someone's trying to hurt them. Uh, so it could be something they saw on TV, could be noises they heard that they didn't recognize. So it's gonna be important for you to start to validate, kind of relieve that. And you can also just say, you know what, um, I, think, I think what we did is we put some locks out on the window. Nobody can get in there now, we've taken care of that. You don't have to worry about that. And just say, about the money, and I'm just gonna tell you, you have to be very careful how you handle that. Depending on if you're the one that's being blamed for it, then you know you need to try to, to, to figure that out. Or you can just say, you know what, uh, we're called the police and they're going to come out and they're going to talk to you about the money. So this is kind of some that they can... Now, if they're in early stages dementia, don't say that because they're going to really wait for the police. I mean, it just depends on what stages they're at. Uh, but in, in my mother's case, it was always me that was stealing the money, not my brother. And uh, so he's in charge of all the money now. So uh, Hallucinations and delusions is... is something that you need to remember too, that at some point, if those continue to get worse, that you really do need to seek medical attention. See someone that can help get that person on some medications. I know medications for a lot of you are things that you're trying to avoid and ignore, but in cases where this psychosis is evident, it can really be very disruptive and disturbing, not only to you, but obviously to the person who's experiencing them, and it's gonna be important that you get them medicated. It takes a while to figure out what medications work best. Uh, but don't be afraid not to go ahead and address that. Um, hallucinations are very real for people who are experiencing them, and they're very traumatic. And so you don't want that person experiencing that trauma. It's going to be very difficult for them to have a balanced life, a balanced life at home, with experiencing either one of these. Because, you know, with that comes paranoia, with delusions and hallucinations. Now the other thing is you want to think about what can I do for myself? What can I start to do to manage this behavior? First of all, you want to think the situ situation through instead of being emotional. It's not easy getting accused of stealing money or being accused of like, you know, I'm calling APS or I'm never coming back here or I'm leaving or I hate you or other things that they're going to say to you that are very painful and disturbing. So we want to keep those things in mind too. Do a self-assessment. Try not to react to it emotionally. And let me just tell you this, that is not always going to happen. I react to it emotionally all the time, even though I know all this stuff, and even though I have all that stuff available to me at the Alzheimer's Association, and I have the support I have, I still react to it emotionally. It can be very painful sometimes and very disturbing. Um, try to respond without judgment. Remember, with dementia, the social, the person's social abilities have diminished tremendously. So with those walls having fallen down, they have no social boundaries. They're going to say whatever it is they want to say. And it's not going to feel good all the time. Um, what are your attitudes and own feelings you have to... You have to find someone to have these conversations with to get this off your chest, or else you're just going to make up all these horrible things in your head. It's going to continue and it's going to cause you, as we heard about earlier, with, um, it's going to cause you to feel depressed and angry and resentful. Um, don't, yeah, here's the thing, I have this up here, but oh my gosh. Be sensitive and avoid the need to win or have the last word. How many of you in here like to have the last word? Honestly. Raise your hand. Okay, good. It's good. So we have some honest people in the room. At least half of you said yes. Other people, those of you who don't feel like you really want to have the last word, are maybe trying hard not to have the last word. But deep down inside, you would really like to have said that one more thing. And so when you're driving away from that situation, you're like, why didn't I say that one more time? If I had said that, I, I don't know that we feel that we want to win 
how we want to be right, or whatever this, we need validation, whatever it is that we need, it does not work in this situation. Because a person with dementia is still always going, here's what I said, they are always going to have the last word. That's just it. Once you resign yourself to that fact, you'll manage them a lot differently. There was a woman years ago who used to be a nurse at a state hospital, and she wrote this book called Keeper of the Keys. And she said the only difference between the staff and the patients at the state hospital was that the staff had the keys. And that was really important. Because sometimes the only difference between you and the person with dementia is that you have the keys. You don't want to be in the same situation with them and bring yourself down to a level that you're able to manage those behaviors and have full awareness where they don't. But you don't want to say, I know they know what they're doing. I got a couple more minutes here. Avoid being ignoring or sarcasm or ambivalence or being punitive. In other words, be Mother Teresa. Uh, angry responses, power struggles, respond defensively. These are all the things that you have to try to manage. This is why you need emotional support. This is why you need it right here. Because we're not perfect. None of us are, and we're going to do that. And that, you know, I even hear myself sometimes saying stuff under my breath with my mother. I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that I'm, that I'm doing that. Like, that's going to make a difference. And you know what? Because to my mother, I'm still 12. She doesn't see me. Anything else but 12. And when my, when my mother starts to act like she does, I actually act like I'm 12. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about if you have parents you're caring for? All of a sudden, you're like 12. And you're a teenager fighting with them and going to your room and slamming the door and never talking to them again and running away. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, using silence sometimes helps, just being accepting, giving recognition and offering yourself whatever I can do, that's great. You know, trying to stay positive, making observations, encouraging. This is why you can't do it 24-7 by yourself. Who can be like this 24-7? Nobody. Nobody. Is that Mother Teresa? I still think Mother Teresa. <laughs> Reflecting, thinking back, trying not to obsess, trying to have time for yourself, all of those things. All of those things to keep in mind. I think we have time for one more slide. Here's some other alternatives. Exercise. Make sure they get some level of exercise. Make sure they're going to the bathroom. Make sure there's no pain and they're getting relief from that pain and try to have respect. It's hard to have respect for someone that just calls you a jackass. <laughs> you're a jackass, you're worthless. Okay, let me be respectful now. Small meals help, nursing homes find that this really works really well. Make sure they're not exhausted and just fatigued, maybe medication side effects, all of those things. Um, remember they can only process a little bit of information at one time. This is really important that you keep this in mind. This is a lot of work. I said there's hard work ahead, and this is what we're talking about. We'll talk about the, another uh, different situation with end-of-life care at the end, but I'll still talk a little bit more about caregiving. But um, I think it's time for lunch, and I'll, I'll be here afterwards answering any questions. Is it, is it true? Is it over? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's over. It's over. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.